Salvador, home of some of the strictest anti-abortion laws in the world. News Hour special correspondent reports on what it means for women there when abortion is considered murder without exception. An activist has been detained incommunicado by authorities on sedition charges. Walid Abul Khair was taken into custody after attending a court hearing in Riyadh where he faced charges that included inciting public opinion and disrespecting authorities. International going after people like Zunar who are expressing their views about judgments or about whatever that they wanted to say. But police opened fire on protesters in Goma, the main city in the mineral-rich east. News tear gas to repel rock hurling youths spill wood fox. The last of the Angola three to remain in solitary confinement for 43 years for a crime he didn't commit. Many have argued that there is no evidence and that racial targeting, amongst other goings on inside the prison, have caused the men to be locked in solitary confinement for no reason. home I mean this is uh this is where I was raised this is where my family's from grandparents aunts uncles you know so that's my connection to this place I go everywhere around the world and say New Orleans is where I'm from Elder told me a long time ago, he said, art for art's sake is not true to, to anything that, that, that's, that's true about uh, people. And so the idea for me that art has always been a, a form of communication, it's always been a form of, of speaking my truth. I can't pretend to speak my truth without trying to embody a sensitivity of the sufferings of, of everyday people. Elder just told me yesterday, he, he pointed out one of the cases that just happened in New Orleans where this kid was just sentenced and he said, they're about to spend X amount of millions of dollars on this kid for the rest of his life by putting him in prison forever. He said, but would they have ever spent that money on him before? Would they ever made that investment in his life before he made this bad decision? our helpers to struggle because we were being held in solitary confinement 23 hours a day. We were guilty of, uh, found guilty of crime in which the state know that neither of us committed. We began to feel and realize that we were targeted because we had been members of the Black Council Court and that we were struggling against certain injustices that were existing in the prison. And because of that, we became targets. And even though I wasn't even in the prison uh, at the time that all of this uh, took place, at the time in which the crime in which Herman and Albert were charged with, um, allegedly participating in the death of a correction officer, I wasn't even in prison. I never met a man in my life before. I was 140 miles away, 150 miles away in New Orleans. That took place in that Golden State prison. But nevertheless, because I was a member of the Black Council Party, I was guilty of our association. And that's the reason why they placed me in solitary confinement. And that is the reason why people like me, who heard about our case, got on board and decided to to rally behind us, to get some people to work, uh, you know, to give us some kind of grassroots support. Seeing Jesse Prime's installation with the solitary confinement in this building, you know, standing in that space, there's no factual reason as to why he should be there. There's, there's no hard evidence that supports why he's in the condition that he's in or, the, or the, the, the space that he's in. To physically step inside of that reality immediately brought another level of empathy, another level of, of, of understanding why it's important that we continue to mention his name and to continue to talk about these cases. Because I feel like we, we can't allow people to forget that this is happening. Because for some people, that reality they can't escape from. You know, it's easy for us on the outside to escape from these realities. But I feel like we have to, as artists, continue like to remind people and show people, you know, that this is happening and something's got to be done. Thank you. 
I did a lot of research on this particular case of injustice and gay rights bashing and this attack motivated by rage case. Uh, he got attacked because he was basically in love with a dark-skinned man on a very quiet, you know, uh, plaza in Athens, and that's it. This particular case felt very personal because I also was the subject of not lynching luckily, but being surrounded in the 80s by a herd of skinheads. And I tried to revisit that moment because it drew so many similarities and, and it brought back all of these older emotions to life and it just came naturally. The purpose of the art is to tell a story, and the purpose of telling a story is to tell a story that might not have been told before, or tell a story that needs to be told. Oh, She's been incarcerated for about seven years now, I think seven or eight years, and she has a 30-year sentence. It's interesting because I think no matter what the project is, I've been doing murals for much longer than I've been pregnant, you know, and um, you always kind of go into the process and just open because even if you know, this is something I do really relate to her on. It's just kind of like the thrill of having this baby. You know, she was nine months pregnant when, when she miscarried, which is, and it was two days after she had been assaulted. And um, still she was arrested for that. Just being pregnant and kind of feeling this baby inside of me and knowing that she lost her baby and then was punished for it is kind of unbelievable. And also kind of from this privileged position of having really good prenatal health care where I go to the doctor every month, you know, have a checkup, make sure everything's okay. And in El Salvador, one of the biggest problems is that they have almost no access to prenatal health care, the majority of the population. I can't really pretend I know what it's like to be her at all. So the most I can do, I feel like, is make some kind of tribute to her and draw attention to her case from this one piece that we share kind of as a woman. But then there's an infinite kind of space that she occupies that I hope that other people will be able to empathize with that really goes beyond what we can really imagine in, in our society. Someone Tassim is currently active. Medias and different human rights institutions like Amnesty International have protested to this brutal and savage react. Despite of all that, the Islamic regime in Iran has announced that they would execute him on the Thursday tomorrow, very early in the morning. We are asking you, in the last moments, the day of the Wednesday, February 18th, the contact with the Islamic regime authorities to help to prevent someone's execution.
17-year-old victim of torture. They arrested him and forced him to admit to a crime he didn't commit. And after confessing, uh, he received the death penalty. They told him that they were going to hang him. And um, after tons of petitions, they got the death penalty thrown out, but he's still incarcerated. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to bring awareness. It was a point where his family didn't know where he was, and I have three children. To not know where your mother is, and to not know where your children are, it's, it's, it's no words for that. journalist that was in prison, beaten, tortured in Uzbekistan. Things like this can still exist and still do exist in the way that, you know, people are jailed for, for their words, you know, for speaking their version of the truth and, you know, that all truths aren't considered free and, you know, I think that it's, it's definitely relative to uh, the times now, you know, again, with all the freedom and all, you know, that we have within our fingertips and our grasp to get messages out, to reach out to the rest of the world and to tell people how we feel and so forth. For someone to sort of get caught in that and, and have that, this whole thing happen to them, I think is, it just kind of goes to show that, you know, as, as much as we grow and evolve, you know, we still, I guess, don't. You know, we only get so far before we start to inevitably regress within our way of thinking. A possible political showdown in the Democratic Republic of Congo was thwarted. Already four have been killed and many injured as protesters continue to match against security forces, fired warning shots and tear gas to disperse hundreds of protesters marching against the referendum they say is a plot to extend the president's grip on power. This particular piece is a gathering that takes place in a neighborhood called Ipain. And this gathering is also setting up what is, is serving as a pretense to what is going to take place. The police are actually getting ready to dismiss the crowd that is gathering. And um, this is an incident that I witnessed myself back in 2013. You these people out. It's a freedom for this country. You said this country has a law. You need to that the people to be outside today, not tomorrow. After four days, they are doing it, nothing. You did today, you must be outside, not tomorrow, today. Over 100 people protested outside on Monday against the arrests last week of Congolese citizens. Last Thursday, South African police arrested 150 supporters of opposing Congolese political factions over public violence during the DRC's chaotic electoral process. 130 were released on Friday, while 20 remained behind bars. Despite the numerous charges, Congolese activists believe that the arrests were politically motivated. The issue that is being brought up by Amnesty International only highlights even more the fact that the issues in the Congo are far more than cases of uh, individuals being wrongly accused of insurrection or wrongly being accused of inciting terrorism. The people don't have a vested interest as they should. They're living their lives day to day, hand to mouth, 
as if they're strangers in their own country. My work always spoke about issues that I felt were intimate to me, but that were also significant to uh, everyday people. And these were issues that had to do with showcasing the, dig the dignity of people in all walks of life, all status. So I could talk to someone that is sleeping on the street the same way that I could talk to someone that, lived, that has a mansion. Zunar is, a, is an artist, he's a political cartoonist, and he's battling oppression in his own home country of Malaysia. I'm battling oppression in my own country here in America, just as a Native American. We're stereotyped, we're looked at as buffoons, we're criticized. I don't like it. And so the way I look at my art and my role in making art in American society is to push back against institutional racism battling it in media, battling it. You have multi-million dollar sports franchises clowning us on the daily, clowning us regularly. They say they're honoring us, but they didn't ask us. We didn't ask to be honored. You know, I say this, I cannot be your hero and your mascot at the same time. I ain't your sidekick. I ain't your boy. So when I read about Zunar from Malaysia, and he's actually getting put in jail for Twitter, for his art, for his cartoons. It inspired me. I wanted to support that type of artist that's doing everything he can. Because what's interesting is Native people, people of color, we don't have access. We don't have access to galleries. We don't have access to museums. We don't have access to, uh, to media. But we do have social media. I think one of the uh, hopes that this particular event and installation uh, hopes to accomplish is inspiring people to activate themselves, um, let the art open their hearts and minds to the issues that the specific artists are choosing to represent, and for the art to inspire not only themselves to participate in the letter writing campaign, but also invite their community when they leave this space who are not able to be here, and to inspire them to also write letters.